Good evening, everyone. Welcome to meeting number one for the Johnny Cage Ed Hyde's Elementary Capacity Relief Study. My name is Dr. Wheatley Phillip, and I am Executive Director working for Baltimore County in the Department of Research and Strategic Planning. We thank you so much for volunteering and offering your time to participate as part of this process. Tonight we have a goal. The goal is to make sure that members of the community are engaged, members of the community are involved in a process that we want to be open and also to be transparent. Members of the committee have volunteered to participate, but we also have members of BCPS staff that are here with us tonight. What I'd like to do is begin first by introducing the members of BCPS staff and then move into introducing the members of the committee. As part of Team BCPS, we have our community superintendent who is in charge of the West Zone, and her name is Dr. Raquel Jones. We also have Ms. Melissa DiDonato, who is executive director for elementary schools in the zone, West Zone as well. We have members from BCPS in terms of Office of Special Education. We have transportation. We have school safety. We also have folks here that would pr provide information regarding um, food and nutrition as well as um, other offices in addition to that. What I'd like to do at this time is to introduce the members of our strategic planning team. We have Ms. Melissa Appler, who's our coordinator. We also have Mr. Jeff Mike. Godfordson, who is our specialist. We have Mr. Chris Picado, who is our planning analyst. At this time, I'd like to introduce the members of the committee. Hi, my name's Amanda DeLeo, and I am the representative from the Southwest Education um, Advisory Council. Hello, my name is Patrice Barnes, and I'm a parent at Edmondson Heights Elementary. Um, hello, I'm Tricia Collins-McCarthy, and I'm the principal at Johnny Cake Elementary School. Hi, my name is Rachel Smith. I'm a parent and the president of the PTA at Johnny Cake Elementary. Hi, I'm Laura Eigel. I'm a teacher at Edmondson Heights Elementary. Good evening. I'm Julie McDivitt, principal at Edmondson Heights. Hi, I'm Jolene Anticoli, and I teach at Johnny Cake. Hi, good evening. I'm Obi Linson. I'm a parent at Johnny Cake Elementary. So we do thank the members of the committee for participating and being part of this process. Supporting us through this entire process is Mr. Matt Cropper. He is a contractor that is working with BCPS to facilitate this process. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Cropper. Thank you very much, Dr. Wheatley Phillips. And uh, thank you all for coming and, and, and being willing to participate in this process. It's very important to have you guys uh, as, as, part of this, as part of this process. Um, a little bit about uh, the agenda tonight. Uh, we're just going to give you an overview of the goals and uh, some of the calendar and some of the primary objectives for the study. Um, we're going to give you a little bit of background of uh, in, uh, orientation on the background information that we've given you at, as a starting point for this process. And then you're going to go through a couple of exercises. I do see some familiar faces, some people that, that worked on the study at the uh, Johnny Cake folks that we saw, and maybe Ed Edmondson Heights too, uh, that were part of the process that I was involved in a couple years ago. So welcome back. I'm happy to, happy to see you guys. Um, and then we're going to discuss our next steps and adjourn. So um, tonight's goals are for you to f familiarize you with the, these materials and the other tools that we have available. We want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, practicing norms for committee engagement, uh, just setting some of the framework for that and then review and agree on boundary study planning blocks. So we'll uh, have you, give you guys some time to study some of the, some of the geography that we've uh, drafted as a starting point for you to consider. Uh, starting before we get there, we'll talk a little bit about the committee. Um, we have represent, representatives from each school, uh, nine members total sitting on this committee. Um, two principals, we have two teachers and slash staff representatives on this committee and four parents, which are two parents from each school that's in this uh, affected study, and then one Area Educational Advisory Council representative. Um, I think before I go any further, I did see one. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, sir. Thank you. Uh, Haroon Rashid. I'm a uh, parent of a student at Edmondson Heights Elementary School. Great. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so as a committee, we ask you guys to, um, to come here when you get to these meetings to think objectively. We ask you to take off the parent hat, the teacher hat, the, you know, the hat where you're so uh, embedded in your school and passionate about your school, which that's good. But we ask you to sort of set that aside and focus on a plan and focus on planning that's, uh, that's best for all children in the study area. So you're not here necessarily just to speak and think about your school. What we want to think about is a plan that helps, uh, helps both schools and the outcome of this is, is a benefit that, that helps both schools uh, as, as a result. Um, we do ask you to attend all meetings, um, which, is, which is understood. And we're going to be meeting five times from January through April. So about every other week we'll be getting together as a group. And then we ask that you guys um, please keep the work of the committee um, in, in, this, in this room. And so try not to have sub-meetings like a, a meet at a coffee shop with three or four of you. Because what we like to do is we like to have all the work of the committee here so that the full committee can benefit from, from your conversation and your consideration. Um, but during these meetings, you guys are going to be working together through, through exercises and collaboration. And then the public is welcome to observe. Uh, we invite the public in, to, to come up, watch these meetings. And uh, they just can't participate at, at these particular meetings, but uh, they're welcome to observe. When it's all said and done, we will be, you will be presenting a recommendation to the Board of Education via the community superintendent. So your recommendation will go to the community superintendent, and then that community superintendent will take that to the school board for uh, consideration. Everything's going to be draft all the way until it goes through the board process and is finalized by the board. I am Matthew Cropper with Cropper GIS Consulting. I've been doing this for about, uh, about 20 years and um, have about 15 years of experience uh, doing this uh, with my own uh, company, Cropper GIS Consulting. And we do this kind of work all over the country. We specialize in and uh, work just like this and work with districts of all sizes across the United States. And uh, we also help districts with other things, but our, our role here in this particular process is to, is to uh, be evaluating the boundaries and the capacity study. You can see uh, that there's a calendar here, is noted here. We have uh, four meetings, and then there's a public information session that's, uh, that's in, the, in the middle. Once you get through a couple of meetings, we will be taking some options to the public to get some uh, review from, from them and to, and to solicit some additional feedback from the public through, um, through that method. And that, that will be housed here as well. And over on the right, you can see the Board of, Board of Ed meetings and the public hearing as well as the decision for the Board of Ed. And, um, and so that's the timeline. And uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillips is going to give a little bit of input on uh, the Southwest region. Thank you, Mr. Cropper. And, and as he shared, for some of us, this is a familiar setting because we've been through this process. Um, in 2016, BCPS was involved in a, a capacity relief study and also a study to balance enrollment in the Southwest area. And as part of that process, we had 11 schools involved, and Johnny Cake as well as Ed Heights were involved as part of that process. Um, the results of that study did not yield changes in the attendance area for the two schools, for Johnny Cake and also for um, Ed Heights, which left them overcrowded. In the initial planning for the new Chadwick Elementary School, it was anticipated that the opening of that school would balance enrollment within this area. But when we look at the current enrollment projections for Chadwick, it indicates that upon completion, Chadwick will not have additional capacity. And for that reason, a boundary study, including Chadwick, is not something that we can support at this time. So the question remains, how do we provide relief for Johnny Cake? There are two strategies that have been identified. One is through moving programs. The other is by changing the attendance boundaries, by utilizing both strategies. And this committee has the opportunity to look at the information, to ask questions, to receive as much input as needed to help support that decision that moves forward to the board. Through that, the fewest number of students would be impacted and we can provide relief for Johnny Cake. When we were considering schools that could be involved in this process, in terms of providing capacity relief for Johnny Cake, Ed Heights provided the most reasonable option. And the reason why Edmondson Heights provides the most reasonable option 
is because it's one of the few schools in this area that could support the additional capacity. And also between both schools, they share bo walking boundaries. And so the fewest number of kids would be impacted. The objective for this particular study, as Mr. Cropper shared, is to really work at pr re cre creating capacity relief for Johnny Cake. By doing that, we can have viable and successful boundaries to efficiently utilize capacity. We can support the diversity, not only within this area, but also across BCPS. One of the fundamental pieces for us is really utilizing the considerations that are outlined in Rule 1280. Mr. Cropper will talk about them, but throughout this process, one of the things that we will work hard to maintain is that these considerations are giving thought and time and priority. So at this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Cropper to um, engage in a discussion around, explanation around Rule 1280. Thank you. So um, BCPS has established a set of rules uh, referred to as Rule 1280. And these are the rules to follow that um, when we do work with committees and get committees together, or in any part of this county, um, these are the rules that we, that we guide them, that would guide the committee to examining the viability of moving a zone or a planning block one way or the other. So when you start looking at making options and, and looking at moving areas, you really want to ask yourself, <clears throat> does this move bring us closer to adhering to these, these rules? And, um, or if you're thinking, okay, do we move this area or do we move this area? You can answer that by saying, okay, which one overall gives us a better adherence to these rules? Um, and these rules are uh, to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods, um, to maintain or increase the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system, uh, looking at the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students. And um, as Dr. Wheatley Phillips said that, um, Johnny Cake and Ed Heights are, are close together. And the walk zones, actually, if you look at the, the transportation as evaluated, which areas could be walkable to eat to either building, there is some overlap in the space in the, in the communities between Johnny Cake and Ed Heights that could walk to either building. And you have, we've given you some maps and some figures to kind of study that. But um, you know, looking at that, that enables you if, if, uh, if you feel is pertinent that you could move some students and still enable students to walk. So one of the things, one of the downsides sometimes with, re, with boundary studies and moving students is sometimes you have to move kids who can walk to a school to a school where they have to be transported, bus, bus. That's not really the most ideal scenario. You want to try to enable anybody who can walk, give them the opportunity to walk and, and enable them to do that. And I think that this, that there is some area and territory in this particular study area that gives you that that potential option, the, the ability to, to be able to um, not, not lose any walkers in the district. Um, we want to minimize the number of times individu any individual students are reassigned, and we haven't moved, uh, none of these um, areas have been moved in the last, uh, in the course of a, of a student's uh, tenure at an elementary school, so there are no elementary students now that have been moved um, in, while they've been in school here. Um, Efficient use of capacity in affected schools, so looking at the capacity of the schools and the utilization and try to balance that. Long-term enrollment and capacity trends and future capital plans, so not only be mindful of the current students, the students that we know live in the areas, but also be mindful of where there may be future growth. Um, we've also been we've provided you some enrollment projection data so you can see what the projected enrollment is and how the growth is anticipated for the various schools. Location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns. So looking at the impact on, um, on uh, uh, feeder patterns and as it relates from elementary to middle. I believe in this area, all, both these schools go to the same middle and high school. So I don't think we have, we have an issue of, uh, of potentially splitting a feeder and assigning a small section uh, of, of an elementary school to a middle school as a result of your work. Um, Phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools, so that's not something that's, that's part of this committee's focus because we're focused mainly on elementary schools, only on elementary schools and not middle or high. Additional, additional things to consider as you do your work is uh, using geographic features such as railroads, creeks, major highways, thinking about students walking to school 
and trying to minimize the number of times a student has to walk across a busy road or uh, those types of things. And, and you guys as committee members know your areas and uh, everybody around the table can, pro can help provide input on uh, what, which areas you see students walking across or where there's busy traffic and, and busy roads and things like that to avoid. And so, um, so that's gonna be very helpful and uh, for you to consider as we start getting into options at the next meeting. Making sure that things are accessible to the public, to the general public as a whole, and uh, as well as to, um, uh, uh, to you as committee members is um, there, we have the ability to translate any materials if requested. So if, if there is anybody that does need translation services, we can translate materials. We can also um, provide, we will have translators at the public information session upon request, and we even have, uh, trans, have had translators at these meetings when necessary. Um, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned, keep the, try to keep the, the work of the committee at the committee meetings and try not to set, uh, set up uh, in individual meetings so just so that everybody can benefit as a whole from your discussions and uh, considerations. Note on the calendar, we have snow days, inclement weather days. If the schools close in the daytime, the committee meeting will be canceled that evening. So hopefully we can stay on task and not have any snow, but it's marked on your calendars and just kind of um, you know, on the timeline. So just mark your calendars for the s potential snow dates, which are always the day after uh, the scheduled meeting, I, I believe. So how can the, uh, how can the public uh, provide um, and committee provide feedback? The, we have a boundary study website that, um, that if you go to bcps.org, you'll see Johnny Cake uh, Capacity Study listed on the bcps.org. And that link will have uh, um, you, any member of the public can access the materials and download and print off any materials that you guys have in front of you as a committee. Um, if you have questions or want to provide comments that, that are shared with, with the committee, you can re, uh, email Johnny Cake Relief Study at bcps.org. And uh, any member of the public can comment, can provide emails to there. And uh, as those are, are brought in, we study them and we will share them with you guys as a, as a committee. Um, just be, know that any input you put on the, uh, in that email is shared verbatim. And so just know that anything you put in email is going to be uh, made public, and so just be mindful of that. If you want to do something in privacy, uh, you may not want to, um, to use that method. Um, the public is welcome to attend all meetings as observers, and I'm sure that we, as the process starts to unfold and we have more options, uh, have options, and, uh, and uh, we will see members of the public for uh, participating and observing these meetings. There's a public information session that's designed for the public on February 27th, and that's where we will uh, have it here, and we'll invite the public to come to that meeting, and it'll be a presentation, and then we'll have like, a gallery walk around the maps where committee members will talk to members of the public around the maps. Um, all of these meetings are a live stream, so this meeting is right now a uh, live stream, and it will be saved as well so that you can go back and look at the, look at the meetings if you wanted to. Um, in addition to the public information session, we're going to have a, an online survey that we will invite the public to participate in, um, and that'll, that will go uh, live when we have the public information session, and it'll be a, there'll be a window February 27th to March 23rd. Finally, you can attend the Board of Education public hearing on May 15th, 2019. They have a site, uh, they have a, a, a specific public hearings um, uh, planned for this process so that members of the public can come provide input as it relates to this um, study. So everybody should have received a binder. I think I see everybody with binders, so that's good. And in that binder, there's, um, uh, if you look at the meeting one tab, there's what we call the background report. And this is just a, a, a beginning to the, to the materials that we'll be sharing with you. But this just gives you some background information and some uh, foundational data for you to, to use as resource when you, as you continue this work. Um, it helps us share a message that's consistent, accurate, and expands the knowledge of each committee member and prevents you from speculating on um, things, that, things that are um, um, data and things like that for the study. A Couple of things to point you to. Uh, the boundary study considerations are on page one. You see the timeline is on page four. 
On page nine, we have school enrollment facility tables. So that'll give you some information about the enrollment of the building um, and the capacity of the building and the utilization of the building and some other information about the school. And then we have a series of maps that we provided on page 11 to give you a little bit uh, understanding of students and uh, how many students are living in different areas, some planning block maps and things like that. When you look at the maps, you'll notice some common things. A scale bar can show you kind of the distance if you're wondering what the distance is on the ground. There's a north arrow. And then the legend will show you the the what the colors represent on the map. So the background colors are shown on the, on the legend. And then you can see the schools to help you identify features on the map. Page 7 in Appendix B has a series of planning block maps. And I want to talk about planning blocks because that's something that you will be using as a committee as tools to help look at the moving areas one way or the other. Think of planning blocks as pieces of a puzzle. It's, uh, you, you can move a block. Uh, these are designed so that, you, that and, and you have information on them that shows you the number of students that are in each block. You'll notice that the planning block ID, it says PB314, for example. That's the planning block ID number. And so if you're working as a committee, you can say something like, well, I want to talk about planning block 314. We all know exactly which area you're talking about. Notice that the number below represents the number of students, elementary students, K through 5, that live inside the planning block that goes to their zone school. So uh, th those, those numbers represent students that live inside each planning block that attend the school that they are zoned for. Uh, there may be students in here that, that live in here that go to other schools outside of the study area. They are taken out of, the, um, of, these, of these counts because we want to preserve we don't want to compromise programs and, uh, and uh, have a negative impact on programs that, that have draw students in and out of zones. So the planning blocks are shown as the black and white dashed outline, and those are kind of the building blocks and pieces of the puzzle to help try to solve the, uh, the objectives that we have. We'll give you an exercise to look at these planning blocks and, and give us your thoughts on them initially. Page 15 has some information that shows what we call live attend analysis. So this gives you information on the top, shows you how many students live in each uh, uh, attendance area. And then down here, this shows you the number of students that are attending. So Edmondson Heights has 472 students living in Edmondson Heights, 474 attend Edmondson Heights. Uh, 467, they live in Ed Heights and they go to Ed Heights. There's six students that live out of the study area that go to Ed Heights. And, and so, um, you know, and you look at Johnny Cake, you have 35 students that live out of the study area that go to Johnny Cake uh, Elementary School. And uh, five students live in Ed Heights that go to Johnny Cake. And so that kind of gives you an idea of, if you want to answer how many students live inside uh, the, the area or how many kids are coming in from out of zone, that can be uh, used. Wanted to set uh, a few norms and expectations for committee engagement and, and collaboration. Um, we 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 know that you guys are going to work as, as a civil as a civil group, but this is just something just to remind you um, to be inclusive by allowing each member to have adequate time and space to voice ideas, opinions, and concerns. So allow for a wait time between responses, and let 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 the let the other committee member finish their 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 thoughts before you. Uh, provide yours. Um, spend adequate time considering how each proposed change will impact diverse stakeholders. So um, thinking about a change and then also thinking about what the impact of that change may be. Be mindful of the considerations uh, that the, in the, the Rule 1280 um, and use them as a guide in this collaborative process. Um, if a conflict does arise, uh, just be mindful of the tone and body language. We ask to use I statements uh, at, to, to avoid blame. So if you're talking about something directed as a perspective from you as, and, and not um, as opposed to saying, well, you do this and you guys do that and this and that. So, you know, th which, which just helps everybody to, um, to keep things in order. And then expect that there may be non-closure and that um, this, this it, uh, we don't live in a perfect world and, and no plan is ever going to be perfect. And so... There's always going to be pros and cons with any particular boundary um, scenario. And uh, just know that the result of this, if you accomplish your objectives, there still may be pros and cons with this plan. And there may be some things that you wish you could make better, but 
there's only some certain things that we can do so far that we can go. So we may not be able to have a perfect plan and a perfect solution as a result of this and just um, understand that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, start you guys off with uh, an exercise um, called Strengths, Limits, Limitations, Opportunities, and Challenges. So we have two groups uh, here, and I'm probably going to see. So yeah, we're, we're good now. Um, the basis of this is, is uh, a four-cornered grid. And so you can see the strengths and limitations, opportunities, and challenges. And as a group, we're going to ask you to brainstorm what you think are the strengths, limitations, and opportunities and challenges as it relates to uh, some of this work. And this is really helpful to kind of understand where you, um, how you feel and some of the things that, that bring to light that may, I may not understand and uh, members, other members may not understand. It's, it's, a good, it's a good exercise. When you're working on this, uh, we want you to ask yourself, ask yourself as a group, what are the strengths and limitations of the current boundaries? Um, and what are the opportunities and challenges as the committee creates new boundary options? So that's, that's something that, it's a brainstorming exercise. And um, we have a flip chart at each table. And we're going to have you guys work in two separate groups. And, um, and you're going to brainstorm and do this exercise. And then when you're done, we're going to have you guys report to the whole group, the group as a whole. There's also a small sheet of paper at the table that if you have any other questions that arise, we ask you to write those on the paper so that we can, we can note it, and, um, and that way we can also address your questions and make sure that we respond at the next meeting. So um, we will have, uh, you know, one person can be the scribe, can, can write, take notes, and then when, when we're done, we'll have one of you guys report out to the whole. Um, do you guys have any questions about that? Okay, so we'll give you about 15, 20 minutes to do this, and so you guys can go ahead and work in groups. And then, uh, and then I'll, I'll let you know, we'll give you like a five-minute warning when we're close to ready to uh, move to the next step. Ahead and uh, I'm going to pass the mic to the group, and you guys can just uh, share your share your conversations, your thoughts, any, anything you discuss that you feel you want to share with the group as a whole. And then uh, when you guys are done, I'll hand it to the next group. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so for our strengths, we put um, comfortable in your home school is a current strength, and um, Johnny Kate. This left? Oh, sorry. And Johnny Cake Elementary students are amazing. Yes. That is a strength. And so are Ed Heights, <laughs> yes. Um, some of the prospective limitations are the enrollment at Johnny Cake Elementary is currently 722. How do students from Johnny Cake fit at Edmondson Heights? We were saying that um, both schools would then be capped out. We can't take all of the overflow from Johnny Cake and um, without being overcrowded, over 100%, and so there's still that issue. Some of the opportunities are for the community to be heard and real decisions to be made. Um, unlike when we did the study a few years ago and there was no result, hopefully we'll have some actual actions this time and the community will be happy with that. The challenges will be both schools will be maxed out to capacity. Um, there will be a longer distance for some of the walkers, possibly um, crossing major roads, um, supporting the needs of students with staff and um, we were saying just the building capacities, bathroom stalls, ca cafeteria size, gym size, and staff relocating. So would Johnny Cake staff move over to Emerson Heights for the extra students? And that's what we came up with. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Let's see, I'll hand this to, who wants to speak? Yes, sir. Okay, good evening. Uh, when we looked at some of, we had a lot of similarities in identifying some of our strengths, um, uh, limitations, opportunities, and challenges. Um, one of the strengths we had was that uh, 
students who live, most students who live within their boundary actually attend their school. We had those percentages of uh, the students that live in uh, uh, the Edmonds Heights, and I believe only like, uh, said like five students or so didn't attend their schools, and, and there was only about 30 students in the uh, Johnny Cake that didn't attend their schools. So that was a strength, so that does show that they have um, a bit of comfort in their home schools. Um, one of the limitations that we had was around uh, just accounting for fraudulent enrollments to making sure if we're talking about what is the actual numbers and having accurate data, accuracy of data in terms of what the actual capacity percentage is for each school um, and accurate count of students in each school. And I know that there was um, a discrepancy around the count in the uh, total student population for each school because I know that there's also some, some counting of uh, pre-K students as half students, um, which can kind of also uh, skew the data. Uh, so we wanted to make sure if we could find actual accurate data to, to, to kind of uh, overcome that limitation. Uh, one of the opportunities that we did identify uh, is that it has uh, share boundaries for walkers. So that does lend itself to having, you know, kind of a, a seamless transition in terms of if we were going to go ahead and have different borders, different boundaries, to have students still being able to walk to schools. Uh, that seems like it, it wouldn't shake up um, their, 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 their commute to school much. It would just be they walk in a different direction. Um, however, that can cause another problem, and this is one of the challenges that we had. So if we do a shift that says, hey, you know what, uh, Edmonton is at 85% capacity, whereas Johnny Cake is at 122% capacity. We'll just go ahead and swap students. Now, Edmondson Heights is over capacity, and Johnny Cake is over capacity. So that was, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem like it may resolve the issue, um, which actually led to a question that we had, and I'm not sure if this is an opportune time to ask, but sure. I'm gonna take it anyway, because I got the mic, yeah. so. <laughs> Uh, initially, Chadwick was uh, built to kind of alleviate this issue originally, right? To say, you know what, we want to kind of have some sort of way of uh, supporting and addressing uh, the overcapacity of these schools. However, it did not. And now we're seeming that we're coming on to a situation in which this is just going to be almost a flip-flop of the same issues back and forth of overcapacity. Is there any way or is there any thought of having new facilities built to, to kind of alleviate this issue from continuously rehashing? Thank you. I'll, uh, right. oh, did you have a comment too? And I, I'll, I'll address your question too. No, thank you. My, my question actually piggybacks on uh, the one that uh, he asked. Uh, during the uh, 2016 redistricting process, uh, one of the concerns that was raised was that uh, both Edmondson Heights and Johnny Cake were overcrowded. Uh, so I guess Edmondson Heights must have had some students move away or something. But uh, one of the proposals or recommendations from the committee was to have a new facility made uh, built at Johnny Cake or to recommend some type of improvement to Johnny Cake so that uh, more students could attend there. Uh, because the surveys that were conducted by uh, during the same process back in 2016 showed that the parents there overwhelmingly wanted to remain at the school. Uh, but the proposal, uh, the discussion that we saw in the presentation, uh, the two options that were presented today was either to uh, move students from Johnny Cake to Edmondson Heights or to move programs from one school to the other. And it appears as though the option of having a new facility uh, is not one of the options. So uh, just in piggybacking the question that was just asked, uh, was that option now removed? Uh, and if so, uh, how did that happen? When did it happen, et cetera? Well, I, um, I do know that the and, and expansion or improvements to Johnny Cake is not part of, of, of our uh, preview or purview and so I'm not aware of any um, ex planned expansions at Johnny Cake in the, in the near future that will help further uh, give them capacity relief. Um, 
So I don't think that Johnny, that a new Johnny Cake is on the table, at least for our, for our uh, benefit or for our study. Um, with that said, I do think you guys hit a lot of things on uh, nails on the head in that um, you have concerns about flip-flopping the problem. We don't want to. We don't want to solve a problem at Johnny Cake of overcrowding, and then create an over overcrowding problem at Edmondson Heights. That's not what we want to do. Um, what the, what the PowerPoint was talking about possible movement of programs. That movement of programs may not necessarily be a movement from Johnny Cake, a program from Johnny Cake to Edmondson Heights. It's possible that a program could be moved out of both buildings or uh, out of out of uh, uh, Johnny Cake so that. Um, so that they have some additional capacity, and that, that program may not necessarily be housed at Ed Heights or Johnny Cake. So that's 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 one method to give some further uh, capacity to a school and to free up some space at the school. And so you you couple that with some boundary adjustments to try to balance out utilization between Johnny Cake and Ed Heights, uh, focused on those on the rules, but don't do don't move enough too many students so that you create an issue at Ed Heights. We don't want to do that. I'm hopeful that 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 result of this, of a combination of both of those strategies, is going to provide relief to Johnny Cake, enough relief to, to at least at least to give them some a substantial amount of uh, more breathing room than what they have right now. Um, but I don't think that a new school at Johnny Cake is um, is part of our study. And it's not something that I have been briefed on by, uh, by the district in terms of uh, being in, in, in as part of this study. Um, I do wish that Chadwick could uh, could assist with this, and you know, we uh, we did talk about that back in 2016, and that um, and that uh, the committee chose not to make adjustments to help relieve Johnny Cake at that time and Ed Heights at that time, um, and you know. Uh, Chadwick was 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 anticipated to help provide relief. Well, in three years, uh, things have changed with Chadwick, and Chadwick now uh, is at a capacity level or utilization level that the new building um, is only going to accommodate, only able to accommodate the population in the current Chadwick zone. So, um, I'm hopeful that that this is going to help provide the relief to Johnny Cake. I was I was I was really. Um, hoping that that Johnny Cake would get relief in the, in the last time, the last process, and it, and it was unfortunate that it did not, but um, I'm, that's why we're back at the table here to address this and try to give some relief and balance out and make use of space with, with neighboring schools and try to make it as equitable as possible. Um, so you know, your comments and your input, this, this information is really helpful. I think it's good, good to, to know your perspectives um, I will follow up uh, the, the accuracy of the data is um, there's, there's ways that enrollment is calculated, they, the FTE enrollment they, they call it, and they take, um, they take a half of a, I think it's AAM and PM kindergarten, and so they take half of a class and, and so they count them that way. And so um, there's different ways that, F, that enrollment is calculated. For our purposes, we're counting the students that um, we're, we're factoring that in when we start estimating enrollment for these options. We'll factor in uh, something to, to, to make it, to, to be able to count for the AM and PM uh, nature of, of kindergarten, uh, how kindergarten's delivered. So um, at the next meeting, you'll start seeing more enrollment data and statistics on the current utilization enrollment, as well as the options, some options that we're gonna bring forward. And we'll, we'll dive into the numbers a lot more at the next meeting as it relates to the utilization and options. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm confident that, that you guys as a group can help, help, solve this, uh, help solve this challenge that we have in trying to provide some, some capacity relief to Johnny Cake. Let me get the microphone here. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I just had a quick clarification, and that is that kindergarten in both schools is going to be all day. The pre-K programs are what are part of a day, I think. And it would be really helpful for me as a committee member to know what the sort of regular capacity or enrollment is and what the pro how many kids are in the program so that I can, when we're looking at the numbers, mm -hmm. see when we move a program, what kind of effect that's going to have on the population if we choose that as an option. Do you okay. know what I mean? So I, yes. the numbers that I've seen when I look through are the, I think, count everybody. I'm not sure. They do. Yes, okay. ma'am. 
So that's all I want to say. Okay, and I will, and I apologize if I if I if I did that explanation incorrectly. If it's is it an all day all day kindergarten at yes at both schools, at both okay. schools okay. Okay. in Maryland. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yes, we will we will be able to address that and be able to isolate uh, uh, give you an idea of how many kids are participating in that program, and um, in the programs so that you can understand what the impact of that would be as well. Yes, ma'am. And I will take the, the, the notes that you have on these flip charts and, um, and we'll provide a little summary report for the next meeting for you guys. Um, okay, so we have uh, another exercise that we'd like to accomplish. Um, this is a, a planning block review. So we've, we've drafted planning blocks as a starting point for you to look at. Um, each group has a planning block map. What we'd like you to do is uh, get back together in your groups and study the planning blocks and, and look at them and give us your input. Each, each uh, group has a plot map. I think it may be under that, that particular map that shows the planning block outlines and things like that. One of the other map actually shows the walk zones and the potential walk zones for each school so you can kind of see how, how that overlays into both Ed Heights and Johnny Cake zones. And uh, just, just let us know. You can f please mark up the maps and take any notes. If you have any other notes, you can put it on that side sheet of paper. And just uh, we'll give you about 15 minutes to look through these to give your initial, uh, initial preview of the planning blocks. And just let us know your thoughts and what your comments are as it relates to the planning blocks. Any suggested changes you want to make, you can circle the planning blocks and tell us things that you think are good or bad with the planning blocks. And uh, so I'll let you guys go to it. Give about 15 minutes to work on that. and regroup uh, so that we can get, get, make sure we get you guys home uh, on time. So um, let's see, uh, which group wants to go first? Uh, basically just to share with, so the other group can benefit some of your conversations. I think I've, I heard, heard both of you guys talking. I think a lot of you have similar thoughts and concerns. So um, why don't you just start with this group here? Does anybody want to recap? Or, and you know, you could pass the mic to other people too. You don't have to have one speaker if you don't want. Um, okay, and you guys jump in if I'm leaving anything out, but we were um, looking at the blocks and um, yeah, it's just very complicated because the one thing we keep coming up with is the same thing that we also heard you guys talk about, which is, you know, we can move some students from one school to the other, but then at what capacity do we have the school schools at then? You know, are we aiming for 100 percent, that's still pretty high because people might move into the area. Um, and then one, I mean, it might even still be over that. So there's that conundrum. And then there's the, uh, the programs. Like, I keep getting stuck on the programs because I'm thinking, um, when I think programs, I think I'm talking about pre-K level programs. I'm not really sure exactly. But I'm thinking those are services that are needed in the area of the school, like moving them far away wouldn't be advantageous to the community, but there's no community structures or schools around here that can support the capacity of these programs that we want to move. So if our options for doing this are moving boundaries and moving programs, and I don't know, and neither one is all that viable, what, what else do we need to do? You know, so I don't, I don't want to sound like a pessimist, but these are just the kinds of things that we're talking about. Like, how, how are we going to make this happen? Anybody want to add anything? Another thing um, that was brought up was we wanted to know what are considered programs. When you say programs, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean grades or does that mean something else? Um, and we did also want to know as far as the state or county standard what was the ideal capacity percentage for a school? Like okay. they want schools to be at what percent to be good or full capacity. And another thing that we brought up was depending on what blocks you move, um, you could be moving a certain population of students that need different services like um, 
English language ESOL or um, something like that, mm -hmm. depending on what blocks you move. Okay. Yes, if you could pass it over there, please. Thank you. We got so we're so into the conversation that we didn't write anything down. But um, our, our suggestions were, our thoughts were largely in line with uh, the Red Group's thoughts. Uh, we did note that uh, if you were to move some of the programs, and by programs we were thinking that it was along the lines of uh, some of the special education programs uh, like Cal's, uh, my understanding is that uh, we've already moved some from Johnny Cake, and but some are still there, so we still have a a lot of uh, Cal students at our school. Uh, but if you do that, then you also risk losing other support staff that goes with it. Uh, so you have counselors, you have additional teachers, uh, maybe even a, 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 a second principal, a vice principal. Uh, and so you lose other resources along with uh, uh, the students, which may just become students that uh, show up again in the following year. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of our other thoughts were the same in terms of uh, creating a problem for Edmondson Heights in terms of the overpopulation and over-enrollment there uh, without truly addressing it at Johnny Cake because in a year or two we'd be right back in the same situation. Did anyone want to add anything more? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to grab this mic from you. So, um, you know, I think you guys are thinking – uh, all have very viable questions um, and concerns and things that I have thought about as well. And uh, what we don't want to do is create a, uh, solve a problem in one school and create another problem and just sort of shift, shift the issue to another building. And uh, so that's something that we want to avoid. Um, it's some of these questions that you've asked, we will, uh, we've noted them, and we will definitely follow up. I'll talk with the district, and we'll, we'll structure some responses to you for some of these questions that you have and bring them to the next meeting so that you can have those and benefit from them. Um, and to be able to answer some of these questions concisely, and I could I can consult with the district too and, and get their input as well. Um, I know that next at the next committee meeting, we will be uh, bringing some options to you, a couple of options to start with for you to, 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 to react to and give us feedback, and you guys can make changes to those. Uh, modify them or throw them out and create your own. Um, when we do create those options, I will I will be drafting those, or we will at, at our office, and uh, and we will be doing those with a mind of uh, of best practice and with the rules in mind, as well as what we kind of think in, in terms of the baseline of what utilization may inadequate utilization may be for uh, for like uh, Ed Heights. If we you know we're adding students at Heights. So, so just we'll be providing some of that information for you and let you react to that. A lot of this is, um, there really is, some of them may not be an answer for it. Like, uh, what is a target capacity for a school or an ideal capacity for a school? I mean, that really varies from place to place in this county. Like, different places have space, more space than others, and others have a lot more overcrowding than others. And so um, usually in our, ex in our uh, work and line of work, and we do this for other districts, it's, we look at what is the average utilization in a region and kind of try to make things equitable in, in that region so that the region has a comparable amount of seats available. But, um, but you know, doing that without creating, uh, making, having one overcrowded, severely overcrowded school and then end up having two slightly overcrowded schools, that may be, that, that could be an issue, something that not necessarily best practice. But, um, but we will follow up with that we will bring some options to you at the next meeting for you guys to be able to look at and dive into and give us your gut reaction to them and, uh, and responses and, and suggested changes from you once you guys see those. And, uh, but I think that your questions and your concerns and your thoughts are all valid and, um, and things that, that, that we are thinking about that, that, um, that we, we certainly want to address and, uh, and uh, we'll follow up with you with some more concrete answers for some of these, some of these questions for the next meeting. Um, well, we need you to have, we need to have on the mic because it's recorded, so oh, okay. if that's okay. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. I was just curious if 
for some reason, this is my first time, you know, going through this process. I've worked in this area, though, for the past 18 years in terms of Southwest. So I was curious if there a chance at the end of this that none of the kids would be moved? Well, um, it's, it hasn't been my experience that the result of a study like this is a do-nothing uh, type of recommendation. I think that we, do, we are tasked to provide relief to Johnny Cake, and I, and I would say that we do need to try to do, make some efforts in some regard to give them some relief. And it's the, the question is how much relief can you give them? And that goes back to the question of how much can Ed Heights take and, uh, and other options that we have. But I, don't, I do think that you have to do something to give uh, Johnny Cake some, some, a little pressure release and give them some, uh, some, uh, some space to work with. Because there is a pretty be big imbalance. If you look at the utilization of Johnny Cake and then you look at the utilization of Ed Heights si adjacent schools, there is an imbalance there that could probably be addressed by some of the things we discussed. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Um, could you pass the mic, please? Thank you. I have never been to Johnny Cake Elementary School. Is it possible to see what the school looks like? We talked about the modules they have, the bathroom situation. Um, is that a possibility? I'll follow up with BCPS about that. Um, uh, one of the things I do as a consultant is um, I, we, we got here around noon today and we drove all over the study area and like I like to go drive to the school um, and look look at the building and look at see how many portables are on the building on the property um, and then it's also good too, like to do some some research and look at it um, when school's being let out or when school's opening when school's starting so you can kind of see the traffic issues that exist when kids are getting dropped off on the bus and parents are dropping them off that's it's good to observe that so um, and I'll talk to the district and see if there's some way that they can give you a, a preview of the school but um, I would I would encourage you maybe to take a go when, when school lets out was that around three o'clock is when school lets out 3 30 so if like school lets out at 3 30 I would um, you know encourage you to go sort of park park next to the building and just observe how how the building is, uh, functions when school gets let out or when, or when school opens. And um, that could be a good way to kind of get a feel for how, how overcrowded a building is. But I'll follow up with you on that as well. Yes, ma'am. Any other thoughts or, or uh, comments that you guys want to make? Okay, so our next meeting is going to be in two weeks. It's going to be the same time at 7.30. Um, and then uh, after this meeting, I think the next meeting will be a 6 to 8 time frame, so we won't have to keep you here so late. I appreciate you guys being uh, flexible with us and, and being here till 8.45. But our next meeting will be the same time at the same place. And at that meeting, I'll, we will be bringing some draft options for you guys to look at and react to, like I said and just keep moving ahead and keep, uh, keep working together to try to, to build a solution for this, okay? Any other thoughts before you guys go home? Thank you all. You guys have a good night. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank you.